Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Crowley, and I am the chair of the Fire and Criminal Justice Services Committee. This morning, we will conduct an oversight hearing on the level of violence in New York City jails. This is the third hearing we have held on jail violence during the current legislative session. The committees held oversight hearings on jail violence in June 2014, May 2015, and has had budgetary hearings that covered jail violence each and every year. Each time we look at this issue, we hear the same thing. Violence in our city jails has been rising steadily for years, but the administration has a plan to fix it. We have heard about the administration's 14-point plan to address these issues. Yet here we are today, well over three years into the administration, and overall, the violence has only escalated. The rates of fight and assault infractions are up, the rate of violence inmate on inmate incidents are up, and the rate of serious injuries to inmates are up. I understand that not every violence statistic has increased. Serious injuries to staff are down, and assaults on staff have stabilized after years of rising. The rate of serious injuries to staff is now below where it was when the department first began reporting in fiscal year 2011, and the rate of assaults on staff has stabilized after more than doubling between 2009 and 2015. But the rate of serious injuries to inmates from inmates has risen for six years straight. In fact, the rate has risen every year since the department has begun reporting this back in 2011. The total number of fight or assault infractions has risen for six straight years, despite the jail population decreasing by 34 percent during the same time period. And the rate of violent inmate on inmate incidents has risen every year for eight straight years. This number has only risen every year because the first year it was reported in fiscal year 2009. For these numbers to go up and up like this year after year, something must be deeply wrong with our city's jails. I'd like to welcome the new commissioner, Cynthia Brand, here today to testify. I want to thank my staff for putting together uh, this hearing. And I'd like to recognize council members who are here in attendance, council member Rory Lantzman and council member Paul Vallone. And now uh, I'd like to ask those who will testify today on behalf of the administration to raise their right, her right hand and uh, do you affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony and in answering questions posed by the council today? Thank you. Uh, you may begin your testimony. Good morning, Chair Crowley and members of the Fire and Criminal Justice Services Committee. I am Cynthia Brand, the Commissioner of the Department of Correction. I was recently appointed as DOC's Commissioner, but I have been with the Department since August of 2015. In my testimony today, I will focus on the main areas that I believe are crucial to DOC's continues, continued transformation. And since this is my first meeting with most of you, I'd like to take a moment to introduce myself and tell you about my vision for the department. I have worked in law enforcement for more than 35 years, beginning my career as a police officer and then moving to corrections, starting as a probation officer and eventually advancing to oversee all adult probation, parole and facility services. I came into law enforcement because of a desire to make positive impact in my community and on people's lives. I have spent my career looking for opportunities where I could be most helpful which is why I came to New York two years ago. I took on the role of commissioner because I have confidence in the dedicated, hardworking men and women of this agency and their commitment to continuing the difficult work of a top to bottom reform effort. Often, a change in leadership causes a pause in work and the reassessment of everything happening within an agency. And I did not want that to happen here. We have come too far to let things slip backwards. We owe it to the department every staff member, the inmates in our care, and the citizens of this city to continue without disruption the critical work already underway. As the commissioner, I am continuing the department's commitment to the major reforms developed three years ago. The reform agenda continues to guide our work as we implement best correctional practices across the agency. Under my leadership, 
and with the help of my executive team, wardens, and our uniform and non-uniform staff, we will expand in areas that have shown positive results while continuing to improve our practices and programs. It is my goal to have the court release DOC from the oversight of the federal monitor during my tenure. When that happens, it will be a testament to our collective efforts in moving the agency forward to become a national leader in corrections. Today, I will focus on the major areas of reform that have begun transforming how we do our work and are delivering positive results. First, managing populations according to their unique needs. One major area of focus was moving away from the one-size-fits-all management approach. We have identified several populations with unique needs and developed management models to address those needs. In particular, we developed tailored programming, treatment, and staffing models to meet the unique needs of adolescents, young adults, women, those with mental health issues, and the most persistently problematic or violent. We now recruit officers who are interested in and are best suited to work with specific populations. We take advantage of diverse backgrounds and prior experience to make strength-based assignments so they can be successful. Staff assigned to a special population unit are provided with an additional targeted training program to ensure that they are best equipped to deal with challenging behaviors or the unique needs of the inmates in their care. Over the last three years, DOC redesigned our adolescent management model to better align with juvenile justice systems across the country. We reduced the number of adolescents in each housing area, increased staffing ratios, expanded programming options, incorporated educational needs into the housing model, introduced job readiness skills, and replaced punitive segregation with supportive environments. Since implementing these reforms, the level of violence among the adolescents have dropped significantly. In fact, there have been several months of record low uses of force. There was a 65% decrease in use of force from the first quarter of fiscal year 17 to the last quarter. Building on the successes of the adolescent changes, we created a young adult housing area cohort of 18 to 21 year olds. For this age group, we also lowered housing unit census, increased staffing ratios, and expanded programming to include vocational training. In fiscal year 2017, young adults completed more than 2,000 job skill training programs, which will allow them to gain employment upon returning to their communities. We took a bold step as the first correctional agency in the country to completely eliminate the use of segregation for anyone under the age of 22. We recognize their stage of brain development presents unique behavior challenges that could be best addressed by replacing punitive segregation with a continuum of supportive housing areas. Now, both individual and group services address the underlying causes of negative behavior in order to change a person's way of thinking in an effort to ensure long-term pro-social positive behavior. DOC and Correctional Health Services have developed safe clinical environments to treat the serious mentally ill inmates. The dedicated therapeutic units known as the Clinical Alternatives to Punitive Segregation, or CAPS, and the Program for Accelerating Clinical Effectiveness, PACE, offers inpatient settings to patients in our custody. Treating inmates like patients in safe, comfortable spaces has not just improved their health, it has improved safety for our staff and for them. As stated in the Mayor's Smaller, Safer, Fairer report, uses of force rates are about 70% lower than expected for this group. We in CSH are committed to opening several more PACE units, bringing the total to 12 by 2020. And to address the unique needs of the female population, we have implemented targeted programming and services, included discharge planning, substance abuse programs, art therapy, hard and soft vocational skills training, parenting classes, educational programs, and partnerships with community-based organizations, including the Fortune Society, Osborne Association, and Our Children. Staff who work with the female population are provide trauma-informed, gender-responsive training to make sure staff have the best tools available in order to do their jobs effectively. Second, transforming general population. While specialized management for certain populations, we also transformed our general population housing areas where most of our inmates are housed. In the accelerated program units, the APU, which is a model for GP, an incentive-based behavior management model has been instituted. 
This model rewards positive behavior, which in turn offers alternative sanctioning options for negative behavior. The APUs also utilize the new housing unit balancer, or the hub, our classification system, which is based on an inmate's assessed propensity for violence. Staff in these units are trained on the new unit management system and the areas are physically renovated to make them safer and a better environment to live in. The APU restarts began just over two years ago, one housing area at a time. Today there are restarts in six of the jails and approximately 1,400 inmates or 18% of our adult detainees live in restarted units and we are continuing to expand the model. The GP restarts are accompanied by the introduction of the incident command system method of responding to incidents. Under ICS, incident responses are tailored to the need of the situation, starting with de-escalation techniques whenever possible. The improved incident responses of ICS lead to better outcomes as demonstrated by the significant drop in uses of force resulting in injury and a slight drop in total uses of force from FY16 to FY17. We have begun offering five hours of programming every day to all GP inmates regardless of whether they are already in an APU. Programming is critical to running a safe facility. Some programs such as anger management and therapeutic activities can address the underlying causes of violence. Vocational and life skills prepare people to successfully return to our communities which helps reduce recidivism which in turn reduces violence. The total number of inmates participating in vocational training programs increased by 143% from fiscal year 16 to 17. In addition to positively promoting important reentry and life skills, programming reduces an inmate's idle time, which in itself can reduce violence. These housing models create safer environments in the jails and prepare people to be more successful when they return to our communities. When we provide those in our custody with supportive environments and opportunities to change their lives, we believe that most will take advantage of those opportunities and our jails and communities will become safer places. Third, management of problematic inmates. While the majority, 96% of pretrial detainees and city center inmates are never involved in any violence or misconduct while in DOC custody, there's a relatively small number of inmates who drive violence and threaten the security of our facilities. This challenging population has also been the focus of reforms and improved management models. Historically, inmates in DOC custody who persistently violated rules would accrue punitive segregation days and could have stayed in punitive segregation for months on end. While punitive segregation can provide a short-term, immediate response to violence, it is not a successful long-term management tool or solution. The impact of long-term segregation can actually increase violent tendencies, which is detrimental for the staff, inmates, facilities, and our communities. DOC has been at the forefront of segregation reform. In addition to removing all inmates under the age of 22 from punitive segregation, we reduce time spent there to 30 days maximum at any one time and a 60-day cap within a six-month period. Today, punitive segregation is only used as an immediate response to a serious violent act such as a stabbing or slashing to ensure the safety for staff and inmates in the facility. For long-term management of challenging inmates, we have created enhanced supervision housing. In ESH, inmates are locked out, meaning that they are able to commingle in the day room for at least seven hours every day. Through positive behavior and program participation, they are able to move through the ESH level system and earn additional lockout time. Incentivizing positive behavior is critical for changing behavior, as is the targeted programming and training that is offered in the unit. Fourth, staff training. One of the most critical components of the reform agenda is providing more enhanced and relevant training to our staff so they have the tools necessary to do their job safely and effectively. In recent years, we expanded our new recruit training to 23 weeks and increased their on-the-job training time. Additionally, we have increased in-service training opportunities for our tenured staff. In order to ensure we are training the most relevant content in cutting-edge correctional techniques to new recruits, the National Institute of Corrections will conduct an evaluation of our curriculum in early 2018 and make recommendations for improvements where appropriate. 
Most recently, we redesigned the academy structure, putting a deputy commissioner in charge of all uniform and non-uniform staff training. There are now three distinct divisions within the academy, recruit, in-service, and leadership development. With this configuration, <coughs> trainers and resources can be more appropriately deployed and managed. By adding a leadership development track, staff will be able to take management and leadership classes in preparation of advancement rather than after the fact or not at all. And finally, the Nunez consent judgment. As the Council is aware, the Department entered into federal consent judgment in the fall of 2015. This consent judgment codifies many of the reforms that the Department had committed to implementing. And as I previously stated, my goal as Commissioner is to get us out from underneath the monitor's oversight, and to me that would be a testament to our hard work that the staff has engaged in and that the best correctional practices have been embedded in our daily work. One major focus of the consent judgment was our excessive and unnecessary use of force. Currently, all uniform members of, have, of staff have received the five-day start training, which includes training on proper use of force, defense tactics, and training in de-escalation. We will begin the second part of that training, which is a refresher in the use of force policy and several days of de-escalation techniques training. These skills will enhance officers' ability to foresee an inmate's potential escalation of negative behavior, intervene, and de-escalate situations without the need to use force where appropriate. Crisis intervention team skills training is also provided to staff who work in areas with the seriously mentally ill inmates in our care. DOC and clinical staff attend CIT training together so that they are able to respond to those in crisis as a cohesive and unified team who understand both the security and clinical concerns within the unit. These critical trainings better equip staff to respond to incidents without needing to use force. Assaults on staff and uses of force involving serious injury have both decreased significantly in the last few years. Assaults on staff with serious injury have dropped 65% from FY14 to FY17, and use of force with serious injury has decreased 53% from FY14 to FY17. I expect to see further reductions as more staff are trained and they're able to hone their skills. When the Nunez Monitor's fourth compliance report was recently released, it showed that we, what we already knew. The department has come far and seen some success, but we are not yet where we need to be. We are subject to 316 unique stipulations of the judgment and are in compliance with over 95% of those stipulations currently under review. I understand that everyone would like us to be further along than we are, but I also understand that sustainable culture and practice change takes time. The monitor clearly stated that we are 20 months into the monitoring ship and there was no expectation that we would be further along than we are now. In looking forward, for all these successes, we still have a long way to go. There are still too many officers being assaulted. There are stu still too many uses of force in fights. There are far too many stabbings and slashings. We must always work to do better. I believe that by supporting our staff, expanding the reforms that have already begun showing positive results and providing inmates with opportunities for change, that we will create safer jail environments for staff, visitors, and individuals in our custody. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today and happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we've been joined by uh, my colleague from the Bronx, Fernando Cabrera. I'd like to recognize Councilmember Lansman, who will uh, ask questions. But I'm, I'm going to let my colleagues ask questions first. I know everyone has a questions, so. That's some. But, what? That's a mighty good chair in there. <laughs> it's not the first time I've done that. Yeah. But just don't take too long. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning, Commissioner, and, uh, and congratulations, uh, I guess. It's a very difficult assignment. Um, and I'm going to be frank, uh, it's not one that I am very optimistic about. Just remind us, uh, what was your prior position at the department and how long were you there? 
I've been with the agency since August of 2015. I started as the Deputy Commissioner of Quality Assurance, moved into an acting first Deputy Commissioner role, acting Commissioner, and then Commissioner. Well, I wish you well, um, but I'm a little concerned that, at the very least, there's an element of denial in your testimony about how bad things are at Rikers. Let me just go through some, uh, some stats here, the highlights or the lowlights. From, from FY14 to FY17, fighting assault, uh, fight assault infractions have increased 43%. Violent inmate on inmate incidents, the uh, monthly rate, uh, has increased 68%. Serious injuries to inmates as a result of violent inmate-on-inmate inmate incidents has increased 50%. Inmate assaults on staff increased 42%. 2016, the number of stabbings and slashings by inmates of both other inmates and guards, correction officers, jumped 18%. The number of fights between inmates jumped 21%. Violence against inmates has risen since the Department of Corrections agreed to the, the settlement in, in, in 2015. Um, we are told that assaults on staff fell by 11%, but as you know, the Correction Officers Benevolent Association disputes those figures and filed a lawsuit to that effect. And while one might say, well, that's what COBA always says, the Federal Monitor has taken issue with the Department's practice of reclassifying certain incidents of debt use of force by staff on inmates, which lends credibility to COBA's argument that there is an effort to downgrade, to conceal, and to reclassify so as to make Rikers seem less violent than it is. That's the Federal Monitor's conclusion. And then, of course, weapons contraband fines rose 37% in 2016. So under the, the current regime, which you've been a part of for the last two years, things are not going well. And I don't hear in your testimony any real plan to do things differently than what you've been doing. Now, can you just tell me succinctly what has not been working that has caused us to arrive at this very, very sorry state of affairs, and what will you do differently? So I um, disagree that I'm in denial um, by providing the testimony that I provided today. I don't believe there's anyone in the agency who believes that we are where we need to be with reducing violence in our jails. Uh, what I would like um, our Bureau Chief of Security and Chief of Staff to do at this point in time to talk to you about the statistics that you just provided um, and what we are doing in response to those numbers. Councilman Wright. Councilmember, thank you um, for the comments. Uh, I think a couple of different points, obviously, as the Commissioner said, there's no denial. I think that we all recognize that there is a lot more work to be done. I think what we tried to do in the very beginning is focus on those incidents for which serious injuries occurred, uh, where we have actually shown the most success, uh, as recognized by the Chair and seen in all of our data, those incidents for which there are serious injuries or minor injuries, whether that is an assault on staff or use of force, are down from FY14 through, 16, uh, through uh, 17. Now, that does not mean, however, that uh, fights are down or that the uses of force directly. Uses of force are stabilizing. In the last MMR, they were down um, slightly. And as we continue to work with the monitor, uh, we work with the monitor very closely. They actually take a look at this point. It would be not a, um, uh, you know, uh, 
too big of a statement to say that they look at every use of force um, that we kind of report out to kind of check in on how it is classified. And they've been, uh, as recognized in the recent Nunez report, uh, pleased with how we are focusing in on our data, particularly when in for FY14, when we first started, there was a lot less of a capability to take a look at that. We are still very much paper-based and moving towards electronic systems. That's just one point. The second is there is a significant change in our population. Uh, one of the good things that the city has been working on is doing much more to divert nonviolent offenders out of the jail system and focusing a bit more on violent crime um, with their precision policing. Um, as a side note, our population then, as we have dropped generally, does have a rise in those with gang affiliations from uh, to about 14.7%. Uh, 14 and that's a rise of almost 7% uh, from FY14. Uh, and then our um, top felony charges as a percentage of the total population is also up um, by almost uh, 5, 6%. So that concentration of population also um, has led to, not directly, but has led to some of the more fights, particularly given the gang affiliations and continuations of some of the violence from uh, the streets. So while we take a look at those, what we are trying to do is focus in on those populations. One thing that we did in the beginning was much more focus on the broader general population, provide reforms that um, would make changes to how we used punitive segregation, uh, direct um, uh, infractions, and then also to focus on programming and training of our staff. And as we move forward, we have been targeting specific populations. As the commissioner stated in her testimony, we've done a lot with the mentally ill. So we've started up more uh, therapeutic housing um, areas for those who might be um, violent but also mentally ill. And those numbers uh, in those housing units, the uh, places for the severely mentally ill, those that are focused on kind of the violent mentally ill, uh, have dramatically decreased. And so we then moved, as the commissioner started to speak about, with the persistently violent, those who actually represent multiple uh, violent incidents and trying to figure out with uh, housing units that we can focus on there. So but those are changes that we're right. making. But the, the, the violence statistics that I cited mm -hmm. are, are, are broad. They're not isolated to a particular population or a particular kind of violence. It's, it's almost across, it, it's really across the board. In fact, there are pockets of improvement more than there are pockets of um, uh, persistent violence. Like the norm is, is, is violence increasing. And you can point to a, a couple of metrics where violence is not increasing and, and those are good. But overall, the default is over a large range of categories is, is, is increasing or unabated violence. And to your point, sir, I think that's actually something that we're trying to say, that we recognize in the beginning that the one-size-fits-all approach to our population did not work. Violence had been rising over many years, and what our focus has been is tailoring management approaches to each of our different populations, whether that be the adolescents, the young adults, the mentally ill, or even those who are most persistently violent. And to your point, we don't say that we're succeeding in every single one of those, but I think the change that we want to kind of focus for you is that we are trying to make uh, that switch culturally to move from let's just treat everyone the same way, infract them all the same way, provide them the same ty type of programming or lack thereof, to focusing on training officers to deal with very specific populations so they can divert and uh, engage as opposed to actually um, just moving towards a, uh, a simple formula that applies, to, that inappropriately applies to everyone. All right. My last question. Um, to a certain extent, my previous questions were a trick question because many of us think that the problems of violence in Rikers Island are to some degree um, unsolvable or intractable. And that is why many of us, not all of us, support closing Rikers Island, which has been the mayor's position recently. Could you tell us exactly where we are on the mayor's 10-year plan 
to close Rikers Island? What is, what are the steps, and and where are we? What what step are we in, and, and how's that going? So we are fully supported, supportive, and committed to the mayor's plan. Um, he laid out a realistic plan. It was he was very straightforward about what will be required to make his vision a reality. Uh, this includes reducing the population and working with the city council to identify borough locations for new facilities. We're committed to doing our part to implement the plan, um, which would include offering programs and reentry services to reduce recidivism, training our staff in the skills necessary to run safe jails wherever they are, and for making necessary upgrades to our existing facilities that uh, we still have to run while we're waiting for new facilities to be built. I'm proud of the progress that the city has made in reducing the population over the past couple of years. Just three years ago, our population was around 12,000. Um, today, we're at 9,200. That's a significant um, amount of work that's been done. In June 2017, the plan um, started implementation and the population was 50 percent lower than it was in 1990 and um, 18 percent lower than when the mayor took office and in just three months the population fell by another one percent since the mayor took office and i think that's demonstrating real progress towards the mayor's goal of reducing well, population by 25 percent commissioner I'm, I'm sorry that is just a recitation of the, the, the broad outline and, and the goals. And your job as commissioner and um, the department's job is to, is to take whatever the mayor's plan is. I already announced a 10-year plan. I assume it's got components, it's got timelines, it's got a sequence. Right? He, I think he announced his support for closing Rikers April-ish. So now it's the end of October. So what exactly is the plan for closing it? What are the steps? And which step are we in now, and how's that, how is that going? Uh, sorry to interrupt, Council Member. Uh, we have a hearing that will happen before the end of the year on that specific topic. Okay. On closing Rikers Island. It's either going to be uh, the end of November or in December. Okay. Well, I can take a hint. And um, you've got a tough job to do. I, I hope that you are successful. And um, now you know what my first question will be at that hearing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Councilmember Lansman. And now I'd like to recognize Councilmember Vallone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Nice good to morning. meet you. Uh, I still think I remain the only council member previously serving on the Board of Corrections, so I'm intimately aware of the responsibilities there at your agency. Uh, and I like the steps. Each one of them require a separate hearing. So we won't get into each one, but the, the steps that you put there are um, exactly what we've all been asking for um, with the several populations identified, the management models, with the staff assigned to specific population, reducing the number of adolescents with special programs, uh, female population, a sense of based behavior. But um, i am always been a steadfast supporter of our of our officers in all lines of action from our police sergeants, detectives, captains, and corrections. I do not see how we are helping our correction officers uh, that are really handling the failed policies before you. It's really on their hands and shoulders with their long shifts and the days to kind of deal with this. What is specifically your goal in dealing with the officers that are under your control? So, sir, thank you for that. Um, and I am committed and do support every member of staff who are working in our jails and headquarters to, to ensure the safety of everyone and um, the success of this agency. Uh, we, we are currently um, in an area where we have um, a significant number of new officers who have recently graduated from the academy who are on probation. Um, a significant number of our captains who are also uh, new in their roles. And With those new officers, what, what number are we at? 50%. 50 percent of our staff are on probation. Are we at goal on how many officers that we need? We will be graduating 1,100 new officers uh, in November, and we will be graduating another class of 1,000 next spring. 
and that should bring us to where we need. Okay, okay continue, I'm sorry. Um, um, under our new management support system, I have um, reduced the span of control with our assistant chiefs and our bureau chiefs so that they can adequately focus on supporting the facilities uh, that they are assigned to. We're also assigning wardens and their respective leadership teams in a strength-based manner so that each of the facilities leadership members have complementary skills. We've given each facility clear, articulated goals for improvement and support them in achieving those goals by giving them training, assistance, and resources in order to do that. We have um, taken a new role in ownership across the agency, working in partnership to achieve the outcomes that we've set for ourselves. So um, I am supporting staff at all levels. As I said, I mentioned the the redesign of the academy so that folks can take leadership and management classes before they move into new roles. Do we have plans for a new academy? Yes, there is plans for a new academy. There's been $100 million set aside, and we're in the site location phase of that. Well, that would go a long way. Yes, sir. <laughs> for the morale for our officers and actually getting the proper training, just like we did with the police academy. That yes. Would be a long way. You'd have our full support in that. Thank you. Um, what I'd what I'd like to follow up on that is if, if you were to take the the majority of the 96 percent following your um, page looks like four of pretrial detainees and those who are not committing the offenses on Rikers Island so there seems to be an uh, annual systemic problem with the recidivist and the the bad guy as I always call them in previous tr um, hearings that create this atmosphere as a problem over, overall, and often we'll wind up on page six of the news, but it's not overall of what's everything else that's happening. Are you comfortable that this plan of sentence inmates with segregation for form is the answer? Because it, we've removed a lot of the punitive steps that were used in the past, which I know a lot of our officers and those are, are still at a loss as to what to do and where to put and keep them out of general population. But you had even said there's seven hours still in the community day uh, facility. Are they still within general population areas, even though these are the worst of the worst? No, they're not within GP areas. And I am confident um, that our punitive segregation reform is working. What we do need is some other alternatives, some graduated sanction, um, so to speak, uh, areas where we can take um, things that are important to inmates, um, remove them. For example, if commissary is very important to an inmate, if they persistently engage in negative behavior or hurting others, um, we can reduce their access to commissary for a certain amount of time. We don't have that ability to do that now because of the BOC rules and the minimum standards. That would give us more flexibility in dealing with the negative behavior that would, <coughs> would formerly have been used segregation to, to cure that, that behavior or to change that behavior. Um, agencies well, I think working there with the, with the officers um, with the, the knowledge and the background with that, I think would be a great also tool. Um, I'm hearing some alternative ideas and I'd, I'd like to hopefully we can incorporate them. Um, just the last two points and I wanna get back to our chair. With dealing with the Department of Health, so many of our hearings in the past are handcuffed because, well, sorry, the Department of Health handles that, Department of Corrections handles that, mental health handles that, we don't have enough staff for that. I want to hear your vision because you're new and I want to give you the chance on dealing with that cross-agency responsibility for the detainees and inmates dealing with the Department of Health. I think we have significantly improved our relationship with H&H &H and Correctional Health. Uh, we are working in partnership. We meet regularly. They are a part of our daily huddles. We discuss inmate issues every day. Um, as I said, we work with CIT teams um, in special areas where uniform staff and clinical staff work as teams so they understand each other's perspectives. Uh, they train together so they understand um, both security and clinical needs. 
it's a work in progress, as whenever you bring two agencies together and each have their own specific areas of focus, we continue to work with them and engage in dialogue that helps us move forward together to provide the best care in our facilities. And the last point would be while, whether we get to the point of closing Rikers Island or not, we still have many, many years ahead of us and we still have deplorable conditions in many of the existing structural facilities on Rikers Island. Um, are we going to address the structural concerns on Rikers Island or are we just going to wait for a day that may never come on the closing of Rikers Island? I'm very adamant about making sure the facilities at Rikers Island remain and continue to be the best possible, uh, for, especially for the officers, for the detainees, the inmates, the staff deserve that and they really haven't gotten that. As am I, um, and we're not waiting for new facilities to be built in order to implement new programs or practices or make the necessary repairs to keep those facilities in good operating condition. We work closely with the SCOC to make sure that any repairs that need their approval um, make approval and we have the funding in order to do so. Okay, I look forward to structural updates. Uh, mayor's first budget had tens of millions put aside for structural repairs and that's just magically stopped. So I, I'd like to see what the plan is there. Um, I, I think that would go to be a huge step on whether we close or not. As you know, I'm opposed to that. I believe we have everything in place that we need to provide services, but they are not the correct facilities to do it, and that creates this systemic problem that's there. So you have my support in bringing as much as we can to the folks that have to deal with today's issues, not the hope of 10 years from now. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Vallone, and now I'd like to recognize Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing us to go first. Uh, Commissioner, congratulations you. uh, in your new position. I know you have a big challenge uh, before you. Uh, I just have a few questions. I'm curious to know how many inmates commit 90% of the violent crimes in your facilities? Well, I don't have an exact number of just, but in general about as I think we stated in the, the testimony, about 5% actually commit, uh, are involved in a use of force or assault on staff or, or, or fight. Um, and that's an average on a, a per daily average. So it's 5% of 10,000, 11,000? Yeah, about 92, 9,300, so, so five, 600. Five, 600. And so I'm curious to know, so if you could give me more details, uh, how are we dealing with the five, 600? Because it would seem that it will be a uh, much different place uh, if the 500, 600 uh, were acting differently. So in general, I think what we've tried to do is um, put in a multi-step process. First, obviously, we have to concern ourselves with the management of that population within our own uh, department and facilities. Uh, as we stated in our testimony and in answering uh, Councilor Lansman, we've been really trying to focus on different populations. So the first, uh, we really focused heavily on the mentally ill, those who, um, through no fault of their own, uh, might need extra care and therapeutic care, for work we, working closely with uh, health What and percentage is that? I'm sorry for interrupting, but I That's just... okay. Uh, those with SMI, and I'm not, I can get you the exact number, sir, uh, are roughly around, I think, about 100 to 150 that okay. are in the caps and pace units right now. Uh, then there are others that are, um, we overall have about 43% that are have some sort of mental health designation that is not necessarily a therapeutic um, analysis. Okay. But So we break that down and then obviously we focus a bit more. We had a lot of um, incidents regarding our adolescents for a while and so we specifically targeted that. Now that population has dropped and we also have more opportunities to move forward through Raise the Age. Um, we focus on the young adults. And then we've been focusing in on certain management programs like the enhanced supervision housing to create a broader spectrum uh, continuum, essentially, of uh, management for those who are um, particularly violent. So I, I didn't hear you mention gangs uh, related to those five, yeah. 600. Is that the vast majority of those five, 600 are committing violent crimes? I would have to get you, but it's certainly a large proportion. So that leads me to the next question. Do you have a, the Cure Violence program? Are you, are you familiar with the Cure yes, Violence? Yes, actually and we piloted it in our enhanced supervision housing for uh, I believe about two months and it was very successful. We were working with them to expand that program 
Uh, it's been shown to be particularly productive for those who are persistently violent with a bit more time. So you say uh, that you put it in past tense. Are they still there? So we did it as a pilot, and quite honestly, it's just a budgetary question. We uh, found the funds for it, put it in as a pilot, focused in our enhanced supervision housing, and we're working with them to expand the program. So I, I'm very familiar with the cure violence because myself and Councilmember Germani Williams, uh, we, we were the catalyst in getting it going. I have to tell you that we have seen tremendous success out in the field, numbers beyond what we ever imagined. To be honest with you, it's the best program nationwide. Uh, I'm, I'm a little taken back why it was not continuing. Are you guys having con conversation with the administration to make sure that we have it next year because it works? I mean, I can't think of anything that works better than that. Uh, we agree with you, Council Member. I think what had happened is essentially it was introduced to us because, as you stated, it was much more focused out on the streets and in the community as opposed to within a correctional setting. And so we used it and tried to figure out how to apply it within a correctional setting where, you know, we're a jail, so we don't control the length of stay for certain individuals. So those people uh, who don't stay very long or stay too long, we just wanted to make sure that it worked for the population. So we're working with them to tailor it. But what's happening in the street is having a direct, not even yes. indirect, direct effect what's happening in the jails because the beef that is happening in the streets is overspilling to, in your facilities. So, uh, you know, to get in those credible messengers in there, I think it will be critical, Commissioner. I will hope that that will become one of the biggest priorities uh, in this uh, next round of budget talks uh, because you will be I think extremely happy uh, that, you know, next year when we're back here again uh, with uh, the numbers. Um, and uh, I, I'm just one more question, and that, uh, actually two quick questions. I noticed that a lot of the conversations and strategies regarding uh, inmates to staff violence was centered around training, uh, but you know, the training of the staff, I mean, but it gets to a point that, you know, you could have the best trained staff and they're going to be put in, uh, let me be honest with you, there's almost not a week that I don't meet a CO uh, staff or staff or family member of staff is telling me, hey, did you hear what happened last week? Did you hear, even where I live, did you hear what happened last week, uh, you know, to staff? And, and I know that's anecdotal, but um, I'm just wondering if, if, if there's anything else that we could do to protect the staff because I even had a cousin uh, this, some years ago. Uh, to this day, he's feeling the effect of that violence that happened towards him, and his life was dramatically changed. Um, so, uh, and, and in turn, it affects their families, their friendships, and so forth. So, is there anything beyond this? training to staff that we could do to make sure that our, our staff is protected? So thank you for that. Um, we do everything possible to protect our staff and give them the skills necessary that they can protect themselves. And even one assault against staff is too many in my view. Um, what we're doing, as I said, we have many, many new staff in our facilities who are just learning to master their craft. And so what we do now is we review every incident with the officers who are involved. We, we sit down with them and have them look at the Genetech and see where they may have missed something in the situation that, that was pointing to an escalation in the housing area. So we debrief with them, we role play with them, um, we help them see um, situations that may be occurring that they're not aware of. That comes with time. That comes with experience. Um, we are equipping them with the latest tools and the training necessary for them to be effective, and we continue to support them um, in the jails and in the community. And I am, I am open to any ideas that can help us improve keeping our staff safe. So, Commissioner, I, I keep and I appreciate all that, and all that is, is super necessary, not just necessary. But I, I'm, I'm speaking more of what we could do with the inmates so that won't happen to the staff. 
And so whether is, uh, do we need more cameras in place to raise the level of consciousness that if you do something, you know, you're gonna be in candy camera. I, I'm just curious as to your, your, your strategy team, uh, the best minds, what are their suggestions that we should do next? So I'm sorry, I misunderstood the way you phrased that question, okay, uh, but no I problem. still stand behind that statement. Okay. Um, I, we have implemented uh, punitive segregation, supportive housing areas. I think what we need to do is um, make sure that inmates feel that if they engage in conduct that is assaulted towards our staff, there will be swift consequences. It may not be punitive segregation, but it will be something that affects their daily life in the jail. So as I mentioned, a, a system of graduated sanctions where we disincentivize that behavior by taking things away from them. So now if you assault an officer, you still get visits. You still get all the um, minimum standards that are afforded to you through the Board of Correction rules. We could use assistance in modifying that so that we do have other options so that there are swift certain consequences for bad behavior in the jails. Okay, my last question is, is just um, in relation to, uh, I heard a discrepancy of statistics between what you reported and my colleague was reported. Let me just read this to you. This, was, this is in our report that came from the mayor's management report that said uh, in year 2014 to fiscal year 2017, there has been an increase in the following critical indicators. Fighter souls infraction have increased from 8,827 to 12,650, a 43% increase. Violent inmate on inmate incidents monthly rate uh, 1,000 ADP have increased from 32.9 to 55.2, 68% increase. A serious injuries to an inmate as a result of violent inmate on inmate incidents. Uh, increase from 1.8 to 2.7, a 50% increase in, in inmate assault on staff, increased from 5.9 to 8.4. Are, are these numbers accurate? And why am I hearing different numbers from the testimony? Before I let the Chief of Staff address that, that um, I do want to go back to that last question. And um, I just want to mention that we have a very productive uh, relationship with the Bronx DA's office. They have a, an office on, on the island. That's great. And we have increased inmate arrests when they engage in assault and staff. So they are arrested um, almost immediately. And um, we are, we're doing an information campaign in the jail so the inmate knows that if you engage in certain behavior, you will be rearrested and it is an additional charge and inmates are now getting consecutive sentences and not concurrent sentences. And that is a big disincentive, I would hope, uh, okay. to engage in such conduct. Great. And then Council Member to, all right. Uh, Council Member, to answer your question, there are no discrepancies in terms of the numbers being used. However, um, as we've said in the past, the MMR takes into account, um, in, it basically spreads the impact of smaller populations across the broad population. We try to give you as much of the dy uh, dynamic statistics as we can. The MMR is a static analysis that goes back and reviews what has happened. We try to give you as you know, up-to-date numbers as we can give you. I think that some of the focus is the MMR does focus on rates. Uh, we are giving you whole numbers as well in terms of the percentage of drops. As we've tried to explain to several people, we do have changes in our population, so that impacts the rates. Even if the population is going down, if the percentage of those who are uh, gang affiliated and the percentage of those who are in on uh, max felony charges, uh, violent charges, are increasing as a total population, that would impact kind of the rate for the MMR, it spreads it across. I'm a little confused. You're saying yep. that your data is more up to date than this one? So the MMR specifically has to look backwards. Yes. Yes, and so there's no discrepancy in the data. Uh, basically what the MMR does is it takes a look at the fiscal year, 16 to 17. Uh, it lets you know what happened during that year. It looks at the rates. It does also spread across the entire population what might be uh, very specific increases for smaller populations, like those who are gang affiliated, like those who are uh, particularly violent. 
Uh, I guess I'm still confused here because it says here from 14 to 17, uh, 16 to 17, and uh, here is not. I, I just don't see the 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 sub uh, data. I see a yeah, broad data, that's right. and, and to me, that's more indicative of of the condition of things taking place. As I said, I mean, we don't dispute that there's a lot more work to be done, and I okay. think that in terms of the broad view. Uh, we don't dispute that there's a lot of work to be done. What we were trying to focus on is kind of our efforts to try to break that broad view down to s smaller, distinct populations and try to have a direct impact where we know we can kind of get hands on different programs, different trained officers, and focus on that area. Well, thank you so much. I'm looking forward uh, to having further discussion and having the cure of violence uh, be there permanently and, and uh, give you the best possible chances to have the best possible uh, facility and system and structure in place. Madam Chair, thank you so much for allowing us to go first. Thanks, thanks Councilmember Cabrera. Uh, Commissioner, when uh, Councilmember Cabrera was asking questions, you brought up uh, consequences for bad behavior, um, and you, uh, you referred to a situation where an officer gets assaulted by an inmate, uh, that there aren't enough consequences for bad behavior. Can you talk more about that and to the Nunez settlement and also uh, the Board of Correction rules and uh, if those are tying uh, the hands of officers to a point where uh, it is causing for an increase in violence, what would it be that you would change uh, that could help manage better the safety in the jail? So um, right now we need to balance the disincentives with the negative behavior. It needs to be um, effective and meaningful to the inmate so that they think twice about assaulting staff members. Right now, under the Board of Correction rules, um, you are afforded all of your minimum standards, even when you are in um, a supportive housing area like ESH or punitive segregation. Um, so while we have, a, we have significantly reduced punitive segregation for the adult population and um, put a cap on it, there's no in-between method to deal with, with negative behavior that we would like to disincentivize. So other than an arrest, punitive seg, or an ESH housing, which a very small number of people are eligible for that, um, we need a, a wider variety of options that are meaningful and will will cause someone to think twice about injuring or assaulting an officer or another inmate. Is it ESH that you mentioned, that you said there's just only a small number of units? Yes. Enhanced supervised housing? That's correct. Uh, so you have a need for more units? Um, not currently. We don't have a need for more units, but there's a very specific criteria you have to meet to to be included in that unit. So what is it about the minimum standards that you would change to disincentivize uh, the bad and dangerous behavior? I would change um, the, the automatic um, receiving of all of your options despite your behavior in the jails. Like what options? So um, having visits, going to commissary, um, recreate and, and recreation, um, time out of cell, those, those areas where um, an inmate would feel that it wasn't worth it to them to engage in negative behavior because they would lose something significantly important to them. And council member, what we are trying to do is actually balance kind of both an incentive model and a continuum of different housing areas. Um, so in terms of taking a look at some of the BOC changes, we've worked with the BOC and we're trying to move forward with some rulemaking on uh, restrictive housing to focus on kind of whether or not we can create a better spectrum, uh, utilizing a lot of the different units that we have. Also, we've increased not just increased not just the enhanced supervision housing and those. Um, but we've also increased program housing and incentive-based housing as well to try to give both sides of the spectrum to try to incentivize behavior and uh, reward kind of good behavior and sustain good behavior as well as trying to create a spectrum that allows us to um, 
not directly treat every inmate the same way and just move towards punitive segregation as it was in the past. And you're doing that. You've been doing that for some time. In steps, yes. We have not, you know, I think that we started off with just about 50 in an ESH. We've increased it uh, in terms of the number of units that are available, as you were suggesting. That, uh, But your balancing of uh, time, be it recreation or out-of-cell time or um, even pizza parties and, I don't know, I've heard that there was even monetary rewards for good behavior. I, I, you're not just doing that with a small percentage of the population, right? Are you doing those types of rewards for a larger percentage of the population? What we've tried to do is create for each of our programming areas kind of a, a graduated model where we do actually want to, for those who are dedicated and moving towards program th um, programming, they are rewarded with additional programming and other things. For example, one of the great successes has been moving uh, people who are really dedicated through certain programming and then earning themselves certificates and kind of workplace. OSHA skills, electronics, barbershop, food handling, something that will really contribute when they return back into the community so that we can directly start to impact recidivism. Do you have uh, a number you can provide to the committee on how many people have graduated and how many people have gotten those certificates? Uh, yeah, we can get that for you. I do not have that right now. About 2,000. About 2,000 have kind of moved through those programs. Specifics uh, I, would, would be good. Sure. How many and we have can try and uh, received their OSHA certificate? How yep. many um, have learned a specific sure. trade um, or obtaining uh, a GED or furthering their education? Um, it's, it is disturbing to look at the numbers because we've given more and more funding to the agency to bring down the level of violence. And it's the same thing, year after year, uh, meeting after meeting. When uh, the department announced their 14-point plan to combat the jail violence, uh, this was something that was supposed to work. And, and something that in previous hearings, uh, yourself, Chief of Staff, you have uh, said it is, it is making a difference, but, but, but we don't see that. Where is, can you explain how specifically that plan is making a difference, how it's bringing down the level of violence, and where and what facilities, and uh, why I can't see those numbers? Yes. In the total number that, that we look at? And again, I think that is the discrepancy, but I think that we can describe very clearly where those uh, efforts have made impact. Uh, Every violence indicator within our adolescent facility, RNDC, has been down. Um, GMDC, our young adult facility, all of those indicators are down. Uh, those that are focused on uh, the severely mentally ill in our CAPS and PACE units are down. Our restarted APU units, each of those units as we move forward to kind of uh, change the structure of the units. Uh, we had testified previously that the indicators in those specific areas are down. Um, we have also tried to consolidate some of the more persistently violent, and I think that we wouldn't lie and say they remain a challenge and something that we still have to focus on. And so uh, that is not to paint the rosiest picture, but to directly answer, yes, we have seen v specific facilities, specific populations all uh, experience a reduction in, uh, I think, RNDC uh, is a really good example as well as GMDC, and we'd be happy to share those specific facility uh, statistics with you. But as one facility goes down, the other facility must be increasing in violence because your numbers are increasing. And so I just, I just don't understand uh, if this model is working, why we're seeing an increase. Um, so when it, when it comes to inmates uh, associated with gangs, uh, do you think that uh, this is causing violence, more violence? Are you, are you tracking uh, m inmates that are uh, infracting and uh, creating fights and hurting other inmates? Are you, are you tracking whether they're in a gang, if it's gang related? What level of investigation do you do after there is a fight? Good morning. Um, every uh, event of a violent nature is investigated completely. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you can just identify yourself for the record. Uh, 
Brian Sullivan, Bureau Chief of Security. <clears throat> Again, good morning. Um, every event of a violent nature is investigated completely. Uh, to your point, ma'am, uh, the SRG gang members percentage of our population has steadily risen uh, from approximately 8% uh, in fiscal year 14 to over 14.5% uh, fiscal year 17. The max custody inmates uh, also um, remain uh, a large portion of our population, over 2,000 still in custody, and they are largely the driver of violent incidents, um, participating in approximately 75% of uses of force and over 80% of slashings and stabbings. So yes, SRG gang uh, influence has essentially risen, um, although our population has declined. What can you do to disband gangs or to, to work against this increase of violence caused by gangs? <clears throat> well, our Correction Intelligence Bureau um, tracks um, currently there are about 1,300 active uh, gang members with another 1,000 um, on top of that in suspected status. One of the things that our new um, hub housing unit balancer helps us to do in classification of inmates is it takes into account that um, whether active or suspected, we are assigning uh, that, that um, moniker to um, SRG gang members. So while the percentage of 14.7 uh, active SRG gang members in the population, it's really closer to almost double that in that we have um, about 2,400 inmates either active or suspected. So the Correction Intelligence Bureau actively tracks that. Um, and so we uh, intensify phone monitoring of their leaders. Um, we um, ensure that the listings are posted in all the housing areas so that the staff members who are working directly with them are aware of them and what their recent activity may be. And as well, we have been trying to partner more with outside agencies. So one of the difficulties in terms of the gang classification has also been trying to break down those uh, gangs. So they're not just gangs, but sets of gangs and trying to figure out the paradigms by which they would be involved in violence. We work with the NYPD. We work with the Bronx DA. Our intelligence bureau tries to break up those gangs as much as we can so that we can really leverage some of our own intelligence and phone monitoring to kind of figure out who might be uh, for lack of a better word, kind of at war and trying to then separate and uh, take particular per precautions for those gangs. Most of your officers are going through a crisis intervention training program. Is that accurate as part of the Nunez settlement? Uh, this is supposed to influence levels of violence. Do you have a percentage of how many of your officers have gone through that type of training? So there's two different things, ma'am. Just uh, in terms of crisis intervention training, that is the training that many of our officers are going through in, uh, uh, in concurrence with H&H &H to build teams to deal with those in our mentally ill, uh, the mentally ill um, facilities um, and units. In addition, we are expanding our conflict resolution uh, training, which we are focusing in on our uniform staff. That is coming now, now that we have completed our start training uh, related to the release of the new use of force policy. And that'll, so that'll be beginning. So I don't have a number for you, but we can get you a number and, and the progression of what that is. So I'm told that our new recruits at least have gone through that training. We have to go into and do in-service training for those who are in our facilities now. Do you believe uh, that the new policies in which our officers are able to administer use of force has impacted the level of violence? I don't believe um, that the new use of force policy is much different uh, than the old use of force policy. There was always um, the new use of force policy is more clearly defined for the officer as to when use of use of force can be used. Um, so I don't believe that that has had an impact. No. 
Council Member, I'll just reinforce one thing for the Commissioner. The new use of force policy just went into effect at the end of uh, September, so uh, we do have, you know, might be too soon to kind of directly tell on the change of policy, but that policy well, there's just went a into use effect. Of force where you use serious use of force, that has gone down significantly with officers on inmates. Do, that's one of your indicators. Yes. So that's not just going down by chance. This is a policy that you put in place, correct? It's a combination of both giving them different tools, more training, and the policies. But yes, we've been definitely focused on trying to reduce injuries of any kind for any of the staff, inmates, or even the providers who come into our facilities. And uh, I've heard the complaint from officers that while the statistics are showing that there is a decrease in serious injuries, um, that there are classifications that uh, you have situations where officers are sent to the hospital uh, and need time off, and that's not considered to, to heal from the injuries. That's not considered serious. So at what point do you categorize an injury to an officer as serious versus non-serious? Yeah, that's pretty standard for um, how we classify injury uh, class as A designation. Um, so stitches, uh, lacerations, uh, fractures, ruptured organs, uh, things of that nature are generally classified as A designations. Council Member, to be very clear, we actually, we take that and make the classification, but really it's a medical determination. Once the medical professional, whoever that is, actually makes the determination that there is a serious injury. They, we take that as an A, but we don't make the call. It's basically based on medical. Okay, so that call is out of your hands? Yes. I mean, in terms of we record it as an A if the doctor says, yes, it's a laceration or a whatever. Well, sometimes the officer doesn't have to go to uh, see a doctor. Yes. So when an inmate uh, may throw, like, um, bodily fluids or, or feces, uh, or hear situations like that happen frequently. What kind of classification is that? So that would not be considered a serious injury or even a minor injury. Would that, would that be considered an assault? Uh, if, they're used, if there's a use of force, yes. That's right, it would be an assault. Only if there's, only if there's touching, There is right? a response. Okay, so that doesn't really get categorized. It gets captured and categorized in a different manner. It's still tracked, but not included in the ones you were mentioning. How is it tracked? It's tracked as a, spl a splash, as a logbook entry. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to thank the commissioner and um, your uh, team of leaders here uh, for testifying. We're going to hear from the public now. If, if somebody from DOC could stay to hear testimony from the public, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call Faisal Zobi with the uh, Assistant Deputy Wardens, Deputy Wardens Association up to testify. If there's a representative from uh, COBA here as well, the Correction Officers Benevolent Association, they too can come up to testify.
Welcome. Uh, please begin your, your testimony once you are ready to do so. Um, yes, good morning, uh, Council Chair Crawley and members of the committee. Um, my name is Faisal Zubi. I'm the President and Assistant Deputy Wardens, Deputy Wardens Association. And I represent the members of uh, Assistant Deputy Warden, Deputy Wardens, Deputy Warden in Command. Our functions are the tour commanders, uh, executive officers, uh, mid-level wardens in uh, the jail complexes, as well as uh, go on to even become uh, managers in smaller facilities and even jail facilities on Rikers Islands as Deputy Wardens in Command. Um, our ranks are comparable to that of Lieutenant, Captain, and Deputy Inspector for the NYPD. Um, for the sake of uh, time, I'm not going to read through all pa three pages of uh, our testimony. What I will say is that um, we've testified here before, and uh, in talking about it and talking about the jail violence, it's unprecedented in DOC history where we've had 11 correction officers slashed and stabbed uh, during uh, my 20 years in the New York City Department of Correction that I can personally speak to. These have happened within the last three years with this 14-point uh, reform agenda. And what I will say is that um, we spoke to significant uh, things that uh, were testified by the commissioner as well as information given by the council, which we spoke about the uptick in violence. I want to say that the Nunez Montes report has highlighted that violence is not only exclusive to Rikers Island, but it's had a significant increase in our borough commands. It's at uh, the Vernon C. Bain Center, the Manhattan Detention Complex, and Brooklyn. So whereas everyone wants to highlight Rikers Island, it's clearly uh, a problem that it is the policies that are being instituted that are creating uh, violence and is counterproductive to actually violence reduction. Um, what I will say is that the sophistication, as I testified before, in which the inmates are smuggling in weapons, um, which they take these titanium blades and they wrap them in duct tape or black electrical tape. They still uh, use those methods because they are recidivists to smuggle these weapons back into the jail. And so um, we would ask the council, as, long as, as well as other uh, assemblymen, uh, members, to support uh, body scanning devices, whether it be the full body scan or ionization uh, scan type device. This continues to be a um, serious problem within the Department of Correction, and closing Rikers Island is not going to take that problem away. Um, I will say that uh, in addition to uh, identifying some of the things that can reduce violence is the punitive sanctions in which these inmates that are committing these vicious and uh, heinous assaults against staff and other inmates needs to be addressed. There is, there, the, the policies has marginalized these guys' behavior. If you have restrictive housing for those that have committed violence and con con commits another violent act, such as slashing another inmate or slashing an officer, the punitive measure have been taken away. There are no more punitive measures. The commissioner spoke to uh, asking the council to support, um, along with the Board of Correction, giving these inmates more punitive sanctions. Clearly, um, as you can see, as they took away punitive sanctions, the violence has increased, although the inmate population has decreased. There's a reason why this is happening. When you take essential tools away from uh, law enforcement officials, this is what is the end result. Additionally, these guys who are going to these programs and are constant recidivists that are coming back, they're learning how to manipulate the system even better. So I don't think that um, those issues are being addressed. Uh, DOC testified that 96% of the population are compliant and are not problematic, and now it's identified as 4% of the population is violent. That is a significant increase from one to two to now to four, and then to start reporting that they are increasing in uh, use of force numbers that have went from two to three percent to now five percent. We're showing that 
however they're playing with the statistics, that the problems still exist and that the population is becoming more and more aggressive. It's becoming more aggressive because the policies are not addressing the violence. If we take away sanctions for bad behavior, how do you control behavior? They're clearly giving uh, the MA population a large amount of programming. I will give them that credit, and programming usually does uh, decrease violence. How instrumental it is in keeping these guys out of pr uh, prison and out of jail, I don't have the statistics to that, and I'm really not interested. Uh, what I will say is that There, there is support for closing Rikers Island. And so if you're going to close Rikers, what I'm going to say is these urban and poor communities that um, clearly these individuals ended up on Rikers Island is going to, then I guess the area is to put the jails in these posh areas like Battery Park and Dumbo and Jamaica Estates. It will help two problems. You will close Rikers. And I guess the increase in violence will reduce the price of housing, and then people can afford affordable housing in New York City. And so I will say, speak to that. Um, if we're going to really just do, have a deep dive into some of the issues that are, are going on on Rikers, if we're not actively addressing these guys with how they said we have uh, oversight and now we have clear um, transparency with video footage. It still seems that there's a problem with prosecuting these individuals. And so I will ask the council to help with getting these guys prosecuted and being sentenced appropriately so that it will reduce these individuals and send them to commit further acts of violence uh, against DOC staff. Um, they are clearly giving uh, staff training, but as we encounter these inmates who are becoming more and more um, really non-compliant to all methods of de-escalation, crisis intervention, and um, uh, young inmate management, there clearly needs to be further training in regards to tactical training for DOC staff dealing with um, these aggressive inmates that have the potential to take over a jail and actually maim or murder or, or escape into the streets. So there's clearly a need for more tactical training for supervisory staff within DOC. I want to say in closing, I would like to thank the panel for allowing me to testify here. And if you have any questions, I would gladly uh, open the floor to any questions. First, I too agree with you that we need to put those body scanners uh, back into place. and. Uh, I meant to ask that question earlier, though I did speak uh, with the commissioner yesterday about those scanners. And it's a state legislative process that has to take place in order to have the scanners back on the island. I mean, I already called on DOC to put them back w without that process because I think that the city is better off um, facing lawsuits from the scanners than lawsuits, financially anyway, from the injuries that are taking place, be it from inmates getting slashed or officers getting slashed. Each year the city is paying um, millions and millions of dollars in settlements from injured inmates, and um, it's, it's not fiscally responsible and people are not safe. And I do believe the scanners would increase security significantly. Uh, the number of, uh, there has been 11 stabbings or slashings to your members or officers in the past three years. That's you the number. That's the number. That's the number. And do you th also think that there's an issue when it's um, categorizing serious versus not serious? I, I know the uh, Correction Office Benevolent Association has stated that they feel that their injuries due to inmates um, assaulting them are not categorized correctly? I can agree with that. I believe an assault is an assault, whether you 
physically place hands on them or you splash them with an unknown substance that caused them to go to the hospital, they may be categorizing it as a log of entry. But if it's requiring you to go to a hospital to seek further treatment, these guys are mixing urine, feces, along with cleaning agents, and it goes in your eye. Clearly, you're going to require hospitalization. To just categorize that as a logbook entry and not say that that is assault on staff or even serious or detrimental to their health, I think it's a disservice and they're being disingenuous. I believe that they should classify it as an assault, but that's my opinion. Why do you think that the percentage of dangerous inmates is increasing while the de percentage population is decreasing? The policies in place that are, the policies in place that are, are clearly meant to uh, have punitive sanctions on the inmates has been significantly marginalized. Uh, when you reduce a, a vital tool as punitive segregation. I get the whole argument of cognitive deprivation and uh, creating harm to the psyche. There are other ways of doing punitive sanctions to the inmates. But if you would take away an essential tool, which is the, the most vicious and violent guys that are clearly committing uh, repeated acts of slashing uh, staff and slashing inmates, and you do not segregate that, pilot, that population, then you're actually fostering them to commit further acts because there's no sanction for it. They should be uh, subjected to punitive segregation. I don't think it's an issue of cognitive deprivation at this time. They're just violent felons. Okay, I do appreciate the work that your members do and uh, all the correction officers and all the people who work on Rikers Island or any of the, the jail facilities um, and all of the jail facilities. I have no further questions. I think it was important that you were here today testifying and uh, we will continue uh, to work with the department. Excuse me. No, I just, for the committee purposes, everybody uh, who is there on uh, the day is testifying is all a part of the Assistant Deputy Wardens Association, not from correction officers. Nobody no, is from. from the Assistant Deputy Wardens Association. Yeah. So um, I, again, thank you for being here, and uh, you know this conversation doesn't end here. I, I I'd, I'd like to uh, make a comment. My name is Sidney Schwartzbaum. I'm retired two years. I'm former president of the union for 19 years, and that's Vincent Caputo. Uh, just want to make comment. I heard the testimony of the commissioner, and if I'm correct, did she say that 50 percent of the correction officers are new? I believe she said that. If that's the case, did she say that 50 percent of the correction officers are new? I'm not sure what she's categorizing that's what I, that's as what new. what I thought, but. Uh, I think 25 percent have been hired since the mayor's been the mayor. On probation, I thought she said 50 percent, but if that's the case that, uh, what I'm hearing from we'll all, double check. We'll get the all numbers. staff is that they're not retiring, they're fleeing. Uh, uh, this, just this morning, I, I went to stop for coffee. I met a correction officer. He said, yeah, I, I retired from the Manhattan House of Detention two weeks ago. It is totally out of control. The rule of law has gone by the wayside. And I'm just happy you brought out the fact today that uh, feces and urine thrown on correction officers are not considered an assault. And you need to monitor that because that's going on every single day. It's demoralizing, and uh, it should be monitored and, and included in, as an assault on staff. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm going to call up the next panel to testify. Tanya Krupat of the Osborne Association. Mary Lynn. Where was Legal Aid Society? Also from the Legal Aid Society, uh, Zachary Catnelson. And uh, from the Brooklyn Defenders, Kelsey Davila.
Whomever feels comfortable uh, testifying first, please begin. Thank you very much, Council Member. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Tanya Krupet. I'm the director of the Center for Justice Across Generations at the Osborne Association. Osborne is currently one of the largest providers of discharge planning services on Rikers, where we proudly provide five hours of programming per day in more than 30 housing areas as part of DOC's violence reduction plan. We also have decades of experience providing programming inside of 22 state prisons, as well as simultaneously serving the children and families of incarcerated individuals. It is this long-term on-the-ground vantage point that we bring to the topic discussed today, violence in jails, and why we want to focus on visiting. While visiting is often blamed for violence and seen as the source of contraband, we argue with significant evidence on our side that visiting is actually an underutilized anti-violence strategy. It is also a decarceration strategy, and with the much-needed focus on reducing the population at Rikers, this is an important time to strengthen visiting, which would assist with both goals, reducing violence and reducing the population at Rikers. To give a sense of scope of how many people are affected by DOC's visiting policies, Rikers processes approximately 1,200 to 1,500 adult visitors daily, five days a week or between 312,000 and 390,000 visits annually. This does not include children under age 16 who visit, which add an additional 36,000 visitors per year. This brings the total to between 342,000 and 426,000 visitors per year. Few, if any, jails in the country receive and touch the lives of this many visitors. The benefits of offering quality visiting opportunities are well documented. For those incarcerated, visits reduce stress and trauma, promote rehabilitation and self-reflection, transformation, motivate positive behavior, and promote program participation. For children and families in the community, visits provide opportunities to maintain and strengthen attachments and reduce the trauma of separation. They also provide an opportunity for a positive interaction with an authority figure in a uniform. For corrections, visits have been shown to reduce disciplinary infractions and create a more peaceful correctional environment. For the community and public safety, those who stay connected to their family while incarcerated are less likely to reoffend and return. I'm a member of the DOC Visiting Working Group, which has been meeting for close to two years. At one of our meetings, a chief shared that violence is down in the jails on days they have visits. He said he wished visiting was seven days a week. And while DOC has made strides to improve visiting, there is much more that can be done and that would benefit from the support of this committee and the City Council. My written testimony provides more detail on both the progress and the remaining concerns related to visits at Rikers. Of particular concern is the plexiglass barrier that now separates all visitors, including children from their parents, which in practice is uh, violating the minimum standard. Thanks to the City Council passing intro 0706 in October of 2015, we now have more publicly accessible visiting data. And it is to DOC's credit that there is a visiting working group. However, we have yet to focus on training and culture change, which are critical elements of truly improving visiting and enlisting visitors as allies in the effort to reduce violence. It is true that some visitors bring in contraband or try to, but the vast majority do not. Based on data DOC presented, in 2015, only 0.02% of visitors were found to have contraband. While contraband is the stated justification for increased visiting restrictions, we would also like to see efforts to curtail other avenues by which weapons and contraband may enter the jails. We hope this committee and the City Council will seriously consider the need to support and strengthen visiting, a critical component of justice reform, at a time when in-person visiting across the country is at risk of being eliminated under pressure from for-profit video technology companies. Many jails across the country have signed contracts with video providers that require them to eliminate all in-person visits and only offer video visiting. With this wave looming, it is more important than ever to increase the focus on the importance of visiting and connect it to the critical public safety outcomes it can support, reducing violence, promoting rehabilitation and transformation, and decarceration. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for pointing out uh, that uh, visiting can and should be able to uh, uh, maintain a, a better level of um, safety. Now, do you support the scanners? 
No, just the person who testified. Um, Osborne has signed on in support of the scanners, yes. Okay. Well, I, I might as well ask that question to everybody. You, you can answer it now or, or when you have, uh, you, when you testify. Um, yeah, B, uh, BDS supports the scanners. Um, I think our concern, though, is more about the, the health effects, that it will affect people who are, um, uh, who are going through the scanners, and also that uh, medical staff is the one operating the scanners and not DOC. And if I could just add, Osborne supports the use of scanners for correctional and civilian staff as well as for the incarcerated population. Hi, I'm Mary Lynn Rollins at the Legal Aid Society, along with Zachary Katz Nelson here. And the answer from the Legal Aid Society with regard to the scanners has essentially been which scanners used on whom and under what circumstances. Under some circumstances, we think that there is a good use for them, and under others, there is not. But most importantly has been that any of the public uh, safety uh, measures for which people want scanners will not be met unless they're used for staff as well as incarcerated people, and that any uh, exemption from the state health laws on the use of scanners simply on incarcerated people is not effective and is a sort of cynical and sort of mean-spirited law that we can't support. If, they're very, if they have, are safe and effective at detecting contraband, then, and we choose to use them uh, and have the personnel, put the licensed personnel to use them, then they should be used upon all those who might be introducing contraband into the jail. Okay, thanks. Now, if the representative from Brooklyn uh, Defenders can speak and then we'll go to Legal Aid. Hello, my name is Kelsey Diavila. I'm the Jail Services Social Worker at Brooklyn Defender Services. I provide supportive services and direct advocacy on behalf of our incarcerated clients. So first, I'd like to thank uh, the council and Chair Crowley for inviting us to testify today. Um, in any discussion about improving jail conditions, it is crucial to first acknowledge the vast number of people who simply should not be incarcerated in the first place. Thousands are detained because bail is set, either intentionally or neglectfully, in an amount and form their families can never afford. Broken windows policing and the widely discredited drug war needlessly sweep masses of people into the criminal legal system. In addition to mitigating harm to individuals, ending unnecessary arrests and discriminatory bail practices that discriminate against poor New Yorkers will contribute to, to reducing violence and easing other management challenges. Um, I'd like to discuss the culture of brutality in our New York City jails. The Nunez report details the same disturbing behavior routinely reported by our clients, officers who relish confrontation stoke conflict between incarcerated people and resort to violence as their first resort. BDS clients have reported several incidents in which uh, exemplify the indiscriminate and unprovoked use of pepper spray. In one instance, an officer flew into a rage during a verbal disagreement with our young client. Despite no physical threat to the officer or others, she took out her MK9 pepper spray, and when our client fled, the officer unleashed the pepper spray as she chased him through the mess hall, dousing everyone else in the area. The excessive pepper spray triggered a severe asthma attack which left our client coughing up blood. He was taken to intake which, uh, where he waited several hours before receiving medical care. The incident likely sent many bystanders to the clinic as well. I and other uh, BDS staff members frequently uh, take reports about entire housing units in child with a uh, fog of chemical agents. Uh, more challenging to quantify than staff use of force, but ne nevertheless disturbing, is that our clients frequently report that staff are complicit in, encourage, and facilitate gang violence to do their bidding. In one recent incident, an officer engaged our client in a verbal argument, ultimately threatening to place him in a unit housing rival gang members. Making good on this threat, our client was later moved to a cell in the jail's intake where he encountered approximately seven mem members of a rival gang. As planned, he was attacked and suffered two deep cuts to his face, requiring several stitches. Um, next, I mean, I'd like to discuss how people are subject to daily humili humiliation and deprivation. Uh, for example, people are limited to visits devout of meaningful physical contact, separa separated by a wide table and plexiglass barrier. Uh, to make matters worse, conversations during visits are often dominated by the humiliating ordeal visitors endure to get through security prior to seeing their loved ones. The department has publicly spoken about the importance of jail visits, but their deeds do not match their words. And these practices are hurting families. And just to comment about the, uh, um, the commissioner's comments, if we restrict visits, violence will rise. 
Um, and in addition, I mean, in isolation units and similar higher sec high security units, people rely on officers for their most basic needs. When officers deprive people of toilet paper, food, showers, outdoor recreation, and other necessities, people become desperate and in their desperation may act out, thereby deepening the cycle of violence and isolation. People join gangs for survival and access to basic amen amenities. So long as humiliation remains a celebrated tactic and gangs are manipulated to control or intimidate, violence will likely remain unindated in New York City jails. Uh, next, I'd like to discuss DOC's uh, Division of Investigation, where their division is so deeply plagued with deficiencies that it is effectively useless for our clients. Uh, Kay, who was held at Rikers at age 19, reported being sexually assaulted by a male from his housing unit. He had called 311 and he filed an incident report with DOC. Investigators failed to take action and the sexual assault continued for about a month before he told his BDS social worker. We immediately intervened, but by then he had become so desperate that he spit in an officer's face because he knew that this would warrant an immediate move, and he was right. Yeah. Uh, when victims and witnesses nonetheless choose to make statements despite the risk of retaliation, their accounts are too often discredited without justification. As noted by the Nunez Monitor, 92% of investigations between January and June 2017 found no staff wrongdoing, despite clear objective evidence of much higher rates of unjustified force. And then lastly, I'd just like to um, touch upon how uh, DOC supervisors model bad behavior. A major shift in department culture can only be engendered when supervisors and management respect the basic human dignity of the people in their care, demonstrate a baseline of professionalism, and ensure accountability among the rank and file. At present, this is sadly from the case. My colleagues and I dis are uh, dismayed by the demeaning language and dehumanizing attitudes routinely on display among supervisors. As a matter of course, people in department custody are, also off are almost never referred to as people. At best, they are packages or bodies. Frequently, they are called animals. During a jail tour last year, a BDS staff member witnessed a supervisor laughing enthusiastically as their subordinate recalled threatening to empty a canister of pepper spray into the open mouth of a person who was lying prone to the floor, handcuffed. Such misconduct on the part of supervisors sends a clear message to line staff that violence against incarcerated people is permissible and encouraged. We urge the department and city officials to closely review promotions, demand a baseline of professionalism and competence from supervisors, and strictly enforce accountability. Similarly, the council must hold department leadership accountable with policies that ensure the human rights of people in New York City jails. Thank you. Thank you. Now, legal aid, please. Thank you. Good day. Uh, again, I'm Zachary Katz Nelson from the Prisoners' Rights Project Legal Aid, together with Mary Lynn Worlis. Thank you, Chair Crowley, for calling this hearing and for having us testify. We appreciate it for being such a strong voice for reform in the city jails. Uh, the Prisoners' Rights Project has, is class counsel in the Nunez case, has been working for over 30 years trying to curb violence in the city jails. We receive a monthly stream of information from the department about uses of force in the jails, and our hotline receives hundreds of calls from people who are incarcerated in the city jails seeking help for conditions inside. As our written testimony describes in more detail, the city's noncompliance with significant parts of the Nunez consent judgment means that terrible abuses continue inside our jails. In the last year, officers' use of chokeholds and use of force against people in restraints have risen significantly. Beatings in the head, head strike, blows to the head have also seemed to have gone up. Yet hardly anyone is held accountable. Supervisors rarely intervene, and they aren't held responsible for actions that take place on their watch. Indeed, too many first-line supervisors, the captains, are part of the problem and not part of the solution. I'll give you an example. In June, a captain with an extensive recent history of bad uses of force kicked and stomped an incarcerated person. Earlier this year, that same captain unnecessarily maced somebody and slammed their head against the wall. What kind of example does that set? This continues in significant part, as my colleague was just saying, about because of the department's investigation division. It produces biased, incomplete, and inaccurate reports roughly half the time. That means that, when, that even when there's clear evidence of excessive force, staff just don't face discipline. Since November 2015, when Nunez took effect, the department has investigated over 7,000 use of force incidents, but only roughly 200 officers have faced discipline. Virtually all of them have received just retraining or maybe lost comp time or vacation time, 
only a tiny handful have been suspended, and not a single staff member since, has been fired for a use of force incident since, since September, so excuse me, since November 2015. Not a single officer has been fired. Part of the problem here is lack of resources. The department reports serious bureaucratic obstacles to hiring a full roster of investigators. The city has to cut through that red tape. Given this atmosphere of lawlessness, it is no surprise that the department continues to particularly fail some of the most vulnerable people in its custody, transgender individuals. The department continues to threaten and continually threatens to close the transgender housing unit, even though that's the one place where most of these people say they feel safe. And the department still can't meet PREA and Board of Corrections requirements requiring to screen people when they come into department custody. On all these issues, we need Commissioner Brand to demand accountability at every level of leadership and every level of the system. She knows the department well. She knows the people well. She knows the problems. Now is the time for her to put her stamp on this deeply troubled department. I want to close by noting these reforms alone will not make Rikers safe or sustainable. The facilities are decrepit. Its, its remoteness is profound. It's cost prohibitive. It must be closed as soon as possible and not within 10 years. However, the culture of violence and the unprofessional conduct that characterize Rikers, those will follow to borough jails, borough-based, community-based facilities, unless the department fully implements the reform required by Nunez and does so now. Thank you very much. The commissioner testified that 90% uh, of Nunez was uh, applied, the practice. So do you do see that happening when you're there working on the project? I believe what I recall from her testimony, she was referring to the number of provisions of the consent decree, that there are 316 discrete uh, paragraphs that she put in her testimony, and her testimony whether 90, 95 percent are were deemed by the monitor to be in compliance or in part. Uh, I will note two things. The first, which is very minor, is that throughout the monitor's report, a good 250 pages, the vast majority of the provisions, the monitor reports partial compliance, which means, as it should, you've taken some steps to get there, but you are not, that is not substantial compliance. So I would disagree with her, first, as a factual matter, that that is what the report actually says is that they are in compliance with some 90, 95 percent of the provisions. But secondly, that framework, the number, the consent decree, just from the way it was drafted and negotiated between the city for a long time, has, yes, it has 316 different paragraphs, which vary widely in their substance from a requirement in one that investigations be fair and unbiased. Another provision that might also have a separate paragraph might say something like, and a certain piece of paper must go to the tour commander rather than to the uh, assistant on the watch, like are highly operational. Each provision is not the same, is what I'm saying, is that there are some that are deeply important, such as you will hold people accountable for their actions, and others which are wholly bureaucratic. In substance, which is, I think, the better metric, is looking at the compliance. There is some movement and some very positive uh, uh, re results of compliance, particularly with rolling out the camera installation and profoundly changing what percentage of our city jails are subject to video surveillance, which can then be used to help keep staff and people safe. Um, there has been a significant investment in the training that uh, seems to be very dedicated and they are working very hard on. And there has been utter, in our view, non-compliance among many things with the requirement that this investigation division conduct fair professional investigations. There is still impunity. There is still violations of the use of force directive that are unconscionable. Regardless of the decree, you shouldn't be seeing this in a modern correctional agency. Many of the incidents the monitor describes in detail, and you shouldn't be seeing people get away with it. With this investigation division, that desperately does need more staff to do its job. 
and a trials and litigation division that it seems also needs more staff in order to prosecute people who are not doing their job so that we can protect all the good people who are doing their jobs well and they can continue to build on the reforms. The violence keeps on going up. Do you, do you think that there's something that could stop this, that, that could be instituted that, that hasn't been mentioned yet? I think so. I should not say mentioned. I would say properly dealt with. What has struck me today is the sort of elephant in the room uh, and something we've all touched on in bits or the commissioner did is the issues of the mental health needs of the people whose behavior and whose safety we are talking about. So when the commissioner and the department can say somewhat in passing the uh, oft quoted a statistic that 43% of the people in custody right now have a mental health designation. And what that means is uh, there, there's a range of things that that means. But then we move beyond that and simply talk about interventions. We talk about management strategies. We talk about programming without address saying, hey, stop. What are we talking about here? This is a New York City mental health crisis. And if we are not starting a big part of our analysis with what is the problem regarding mental illness that ends up being de becoming the Department of Corrections problem, what are our management strategies? What is the treatment that we are giving different people who suffer from different degrees of mental illness? How does this impact these other things we're trying to suggest, such as does using a restriction on visits make sense? When what that might mean is a mother who may know best how to get through to his, her mentally ill son, who is her son, and can sit and visit him and talk to him and say, as any family member perhaps who has mental illness in their family knows, someone can often get through much better than someone who doesn't know this person and say, hey, look, let's work on a way to help get you through this awful experience. When you're talking about strategies that might take away that, you're going to be making the problem worse. So I would say fundamentally the thing that's not getting talked about, and I will say it is not the centerpiece of Nunez either. It's, Nunez has some provisions touching on mental health, but that was not what, uh, it was not about mental health treatment and programming for mental health in the jails. So that is not you know, the subject of, of, of our lawsuit either. But is, if we don't deal with that, we're going to keep having these same conversations. Very good point and a good testimony. I want to thank everyone for being here today, uh, for uh, your support in the efforts to close Rikers, and um, would ask that you uh, keep in mind that we're going to have a hearing on that subject in the coming weeks. Uh, again, uh, thank you for testifying, and this concludes the hearing of October 25th, uh, 2017. Thank you. Thank you.